operates very similarly to a ski lift. A few years and a few patents later, it was a natural progression of thought that would lead to the below ground endless ropeway that we are all so familiar with, uh, the cable car. So Halliday would test the first cable car on Clay Street in August of 1873, and it was a roaring success, and it led to several other lines that would crisscross the north part of the city. Uh, are you all fascinated by cable cars? Yeah, okay, you've got to go to the cable car museum. They do it right, and um, you can see cable cars in action, and it's a free museum. It's a great place to take your family when they're visiting, and afterwards you can take the cable car down the hill and have a nice drink along the waterfront. And by the way, they have an extraordinary exhibit of old cable cars, new cable cars, and a, a picture exhibit of how it actually evolved. So the man in front with the stovepipe hat with the circle around him, uh, that's Halliday himself. And the lady sitting on his right is his wife, Martha. And you know, I suspect the guy in the middle is her father, but I'm not sure. <clears throat> so Andrew Halliday likely only went to a traditional school for a few years. Uh, we know he studied drafting uh, under the tutelage of his older brother, who managed the drawing office of his father's of their father's factory. Uh, he probably also attended the free lectures, um, scientific and technical lectures that were at the mechanics institutes that were within walking distance of their home. <clears throat> Because of this lack of formal education, Halliday loved libraries. He recognized that they were essential for a informed and democratic society, and in fact, critical for those that were interested in self-improvement. And um, this was especially important in the frontier environment of San Francisco, because it did not have any educational facilities for adults in place yet. So, in 1864, Halliday would start his first term as, uh, on the Board of Regents of the Mechanics Institute as Vice President. Um, he was instrumental in uh, acquiring this plot of land and making sure that our building, uh, which then was 31 Post, uh, was built. And due to his tremendous energy, he would be elected shortly after, in 1868, as president. And his first task as president was to set the Institute, Mechanics Institute, on a firm financial footing. At the time, Mechanics Institute was organized upon a stockholder system, which wasn't working the way it should, and we were in a deep financial hole. Halliday would abolish the stockholder system and make the property of the Institute a public trust. <clears throat> this change, um, along with the financial success of the 1864 fair, uh, the industrial fair, would help set uh, mechanics on a, you know, get, put them into a positive fiscal environment. And um, it was so positive that Halliday felt the room, that he had room to dream about uh, the future of mechanics. So at the same time, unfortunately the 60s were tremendously busy for Halliday, at the same time, in March of 1868, Governor Henry Haight signed into law the bill that outlined the criteria for the new University of California. And the bill also specified who should be on the Board of Regents. <clears throat> on that list was the president of the Mechanics Institute. Halliday, who had just assumed the uh, position of president here, aptly uh, took to the role of regent and would ultimately serve 32 years in that capacity, helping uh, design its mechanical arts program and overseeing the university's finance. Okay, so Halliday was such an amazing regent that upon his death, the university would commission this building to honor him, and it's straight through the Crocker Galleria on Sutter. 
Um, the, this is the Halliday Building, designed by Willis Polk, and uh, it opened in 1917. And if you've never been there, you've got to walk by on a sunny day because um, it's impossible to see in this black and white photo, but it's a blue and gold building, and the gold on a sunny day will dazzle you. And the curtain wall glass will too, as well. All right, so the notion of a state-sponsored university may have stimulated Halliday's thinking about directing public funds to libraries. The problem facing San Francisco's libraries and virtually every library in the country was that there was no mechanism in place for funding them other than the rich person model where a uh, wealthy person gives money to uh, help make the library happen or the membership model. So in February 1875, Halliday took a trip to the eastern US and Europe on a fact-finding uh, study of the best practices in place at municipal libraries, mechanics institutes, and universities that offered technical programs. The facilities that he visited in the US included the Worcester Polytechnic Institute, the New York Public Library, the Cooper's Institute, and the Boston Public Library. And Halliday was particularly impressed with Boston's system because they were funded by tax dollars. Incidentally, they initially were funded by the rich person model, and then that uh, was not stable enough for them, so they set up this tax system. So Halliday saw this as a possible solution to the, uh, San Francisco's library woes, and he returned to San Francisco charged with a mission to uh, gain for its residents a free library. Scarcely a year later, Halliday and his compatriot, Senator George Rogers, would organize a community meeting on August 3rd, 1877, at Dashaway Hall, with the object of drafting legislation that would help fund a free library for San Francisco. The fruit of that meeting became Senate Bill Number 1, submitted on December 5th, 1877, and that was signed into law the following year by uh, Governor William Irwin. So the Rogers Free Library Act basically granted authority to municipalities to impose a tax upon its residents for the establishment of a free public library uh, and reading room. And this afforded many struggling uh, libraries uh, a stable source of income. 